What a privilege to worship the Lord together. Uh, I thought I'd share a couple of thoughts. Last week when I stood up, I didn't have uh, my thoughts gear all together and that I had not prepared for, what do I say first when I stand up in front of people? Um, in st- not people, but in front of you. Um, it's been four months since I retired from being the pastor. And um, I'm excited for what God has called me into. And I just want to share that with you. Um, I'm able to equip uh, business owners in ways I had never imagined. It's really awesome. But I'm also excited for what is happening here at Milestone. And I wanted to share that with you for a moment here um, before I really dive into what I have on my heart. I'm excited for several things. What should the church look like? Should it be a big, elaborate building? What should the church look like? It should look like Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where at the very beginning of the church, it said they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. And as a result, the church grew. So that's what the church should look like in general terms. And uh, Ephesians chapter 4 also talks about that. So when I look at what's going on in Milestone, I'm excited because I see that happening. The first part is the doctrine. Every week, the leadership team themselves have done a great job at teaching, preaching, and bringing effective people in that are bringing um, great doctrine to you week after week after week, right? It's awesome. Make sure you encourage them for that. They're way outside their wheelhouse. I mean, you're asking a dentist to come and preach. Like, that's like pulling teeth. Oh, wait, no. <laughs> couldn't, I couldn't resist, sorry. But they're doing a great job. Make sure you encourage them. Um, the fellowship. There's great fellowship. You know what's annoying? If, if you want to just run out at the end of the service, it's really hard to do that. Because everybody wants to have fellowship and talk and how are you, what's going on? What well, seems like a biblical thing to do. And it's happening. Great job. Church, that's you. Yesterday I went to men's breakfast and we had a great group of men there at the breakfast. That was awesome. And that's every other week. It's not like we had a special event. It's just every other week that men are coming out and and we have 8 to 12 guys that come out and show up and encourage one another and bring breakfast and hang out. And (coughs) at the end of the formal, in a sense, time, it's hanging out some more. That's awesome. Great job. And I see that in other ways as well. Fellowship is continuing. Um, the breaking of bread is that, that, that communion and, and baptism, and it's, it's really that, that growth that's continuing to happen. Uh, since the last four months, we've seen people get baptized here. People become members of the church. We've celebrated communion together. It's, so what we're doing is everything that God has called the church to do, we're doing. That's exciting. It really is. And then prayer. The church continues to pray. And I thought this morning it'd be good just to kind of pause and say, we need to be praying very diligently for God to, to show who the next pastor should be here. It's not me. God's called me to change gears, and you know that. My season here is, is, is not to continue to be a senior pastor. I am certainly loving the opportunity to be able to preach. And if they don't kick me off the stage, I think I'll get an opportunity to preach again sometime in the future. But um, we need to be praying that God would show us who the next pastor is. Like, not just like a simple prayer, but begging God in this moment. So I would encourage you, today, tomorrow, every day, to even spend some time in fasting over that. Not because the church can't live without the pastor, but because the pastor is going to bring a certain level of vision that the leadership team is not going to have and going to help to organize and bring things uh, to a different level. And you need that, right? And and these guys don't want to keep on preaching the way that they are as well. Not that they're doing a bad job. But uh, we need to be praying for that. So with that, let me lead us in prayer, and then I'm going to share what God has on my heart for this morning. Let's pray. 
Lord, I thank you for what you're doing here. Thank you for how you've brought this group together and continue to shape and mold and teach and lead this group. Um, We are just privileged to be a church family. And Lord, we, we are desiring to see who you have to be here next, to lead. So God, I pray that you'd open up that right resume, that right heart, that right person that even stops in or gives a call, Lord, whatever it is, or that right person we bump into. Lord, you do things in amazing ways. So God, I'm praying that you'd open up that person soon. It's great to see the things that are going on, and we're excited for that, and you'll continue to do that because this is your church. So Lord, I pray that you'd lead us. Continue to grow each and every one of us to be faithful to you, to follow you, and take steps of faith that you want us to take. Thank you for everybody stepping up in different ways. And pray that you continue to give us strength to do that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Genesis chapter 41 is where I want to spend some time this morning. <clears throat> Last week I ended out and um, talked about, a, I, I did kind of half of a message that I had prepared. And so today I'm going to try to do a message and a half today because I had a two-part series already planned, so i got to push that into today and have some fun with that. So we're going to be here to one. Good? All right. No amens there. Noted. Last week, remember our theme? Our labor is what? You didn't pay attention. A sacred ambition. Wow. I know, you're reading it off the front. Cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. Our labor is a sacred ambition that God gave to us. It doesn't matter if you're a stay-at-home mom. It doesn't matter if you're president or CEO of a company. Your labor is a sacred ambition that God gave to you. Did you get that last week? So when you went into the office or went... (coughs) You went in the kitchen or wherever you were supposed to be, and I still have that cough, so I'm sorry. I don't need any water. I'm good. So when you went in and you did what you're supposed to be doing, did that come back to your mind? That my labor, what I'm doing, is a sacred ambition. That God put me here into this place, into this office, into this building, wherever it is, into this area, that this is my sacred ambition that God gave to me. I had one person, it was Rick, I had one person that said afterwards, well, I'm retired, so this doesn't apply to me, and he was kidding. It it applies to all of us, yes? Because it doesn't matter if we're retired and we're doing some work in our house, or it doesn't matter if we're 16 years old and we don't have a job yet. It applies to every one of us because our work, our labor equals making the bed in the morning, if that's what you choose to do, or it's cleaning up, uh, you know, from the dishes or making dinner or whatever it is. It's everything that we do. We spend the majority of our lives doing labor. So your labor is a sacred ambition. So if you're doing the dishes, it is a sacred ambition. And if you're leading a company that's $3 billion, and, and, and you're, it's, a, it's a sacred ambition. It's all equal in God's playing field. And it comes from Genesis chapter 1, where God looked at Adam and Eve, and he says, hey, by the way, here, let me give you the, uh, the understanding of what you're called to do. You're called to take care of this, this earth, to fill it, to subdue it, to multiply. And, and so we looked at it last week and said that's, that would be, like, put it all together. It's to bring order out of chaos. That's your calling. So no matter where you are, that's what you're called to do. It's a sacred ambition. But then there's something that happened, and we looked at this last week, right? That in Genesis chapter 3, they walked away from God. They sinned against God. It's the fall of man that occurred. And in that, he says, you're going to have a problem. That work will now be challenging, and relationships will be challenging. It will be painful. It will be stressful. Right? Right? Every relationship, every work ambition that you have will have its challenge. (coughs) So last week, we we then looked at the example of Joseph. I love Joseph's life. Not because he had a great life, but because of how he responded to the life that he had. 
I would not want to live his life at all. But I think it's really cool how he ended out. So this is Genesis. Go with me to chapter 41 and kind of hang out there. And you could follow along in the text that I'm going to refer to leading up to it. <coughs> Today, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to encourage you to go to the next level. Go to the next level. We're not playing video games. We're playing labor games, okay? When you look at your labor, our labor is a sacred ambition that God gave to us. I want you to go to the next level. I'm going to give you three levels. Level number one is what we talked about last week. Level number one is simple. It's to trust God. Trust God. Labor is a sacred ambition that God gave to us. It's simply to trust God that, that what I'm saying there and what he's given to us is Genesis chapter 1 is the truth. That our labor is a sacred ambition. It's what God gave to us. It is a gift for me to do the dishes. It's a gift for me to mow the grass. It's a gift for me to go to work and, and to do whatever I'm doing at the, at the workplace that I'm at. It's a gift to do. It is God's sacred ambition that he's given to me to do for him. Joseph did that. He trusted God with his labor at home. So when his dad gave him responsibility to do, he trusted God. This is what I'm supposed to do. And he went and did it, not to the minimum, but he did it to the max. He went above and beyond. And then when he was thrown into this place of, of slavery and then into jail and then into the palace, you find that Joseph did that. He trusted God with his labor, whether it's at home, in slavery, in prison, or in palace. He trusted God. That everything they did was simple. It's, it was a sacred ambition that God gave to him. And he re we referenced that at the end of the message last week we talked about. So if you missed it, Genesis 46 is where we ended out, where he goes back to his brothers who did all kinds of evil against him. And he says, hey, guys, what, I, what you did, don't, 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 don't be mad at yourself. What you did, yep, it was wrong, but God used that to put me into this place. So 22 years later, he's, he's saying, hey, it's okay. God used those years to prepare me for what needed to happen, and God put it all together to be right where I'm at. So what he's simply saying to his brothers is, I view my labor and work and what I've gotten to do for the past couple of decades as God's sacred ambition for me. It was his gift. So first, is everybody at level one? Did you catch that last week? Are you good with level one? That my labor is a sacred ambition that God gave to me? Or do you need to repeat last week's message? Anybody want to repeat from last week? Because I could preach that again. Okay, I'll, I'll keep moving. So we're all at level one, yes? That should be like, amen, pastor, I am at level one, yeah. Are you with me? Man, you guys you should drink more coffee in the morning on Sundays or something. All right. <clears throat> level two, you ready? Level two, <coughs> be faithful when it's painful. Be faithful when it's painful. So Genesis chapter 37 is the beginning of the story with Joseph. First of all, he's given this position where his dad says, go take care of this, that, and the other thing. And he's in charge of the flock and such like that. So he understands that he's, he's got to trust God. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. And you see that all through his life. But in the middle of that, you, fee, you find that Joseph, right there in Genesis 37, his brothers turn against him. They're, they hate him. They want him dead. And instead of killing him, they sell him into slavery. We covered this last week. When they sell him into slavery, he's in this painful position. It's, he's not going to resort. Yes? It's not like, oh, promotion time. Yeah, I finally get out of the, the, the family business and I get to do my own thing. No, it's not that. It's the worst. Nobody's there to care for him and take care of him in any kind of way. Matter of fact, they leave him for dead, essentially. <clears throat> so the Midianites, they sell him to Egypt into uh, uh, <coughs> Potiphar's household. He's kind of like the mayor or chief of police or something like that, and he's got a whole bunch of people that work for him. So Joseph had no choice in his job. He Look, he didn't go to Indeed and say, hey, let's see, let's put my resume out here and let's see who finds me. He didn't go to LinkedIn and find the suitable matches for his resume and what he's done. Well, let me tell you about my dad and he gave me, it wasn't that. There was no, there's no like resume or cover letter that went out. He was forced into this job. 
with these people. You ever feel like you're forced into a job you don't want to be in? You ever find that you get into a job that it looked good here, but then a few weeks or months or years later, whatever time it is, you're like, I hate my job. Why am I? I don't want to do this anymore. This is a terrible place to be. Joseph was in this place. He didn't choose it. He didn't put his resume out there. He didn't look to get hired for this. He was forced into this position with people he didn't know. We're not even sure if he understood their language. And he couldn't go back home and talk to dad about it. He's on his own. He's 17. It stinks. It really does. So he had a choice as to what to do with that. He chose to be faithful even when it was painful. Quitting was not an option. Even quiet quitting was an option. If he did not perform up to a certain level, he was dead. How would you handle this? That's the question, right? How would you handle this? If you're put in that position, and maybe you are there, maybe you're like, yeah, it's so where I'm at right now, I hate it. Well, level up. Go to the next level. Be faithful when it's painful. Joseph did, so, you, so can you. He was 17. You might have some years on him. I don't know, but, but be faithful when it's painful. Here, he does this in Genesis chapter 39. He's put into Potiphar's house to do what he's supposed to do, and he does so well, and God blesses him, gives him the grace to do everything he's called to do. By the way, you don't get God's grace by resisting God, right? You only get God's grace when you're following God, okay? That's a big note there. And so he's following God in that, in that he's level one, trusting God, that his labor is a sacred ambition that God gave to him. That's trusting God. That's following God. So he's leveling up there and gets into level two in that he's faithful when it's painful. He's in this position he doesn't want with people he doesn't know in a place he doesn't care for, and he's doing what he has to do even though he doesn't want to do it. <clears throat> and so while he's there, he's given his best to Potiphar and to his family. It's apparent in chapter 39, you can read through this, but for sake of time, we won't. It's apparent that he is being blessed by God and Potiphar looks and says, good night, this guy is just awesome puts in charge of this, that, and the other thing. He's in charge of everything except for one thing, his wife, which would be right. Nobody should be in charge of your wife, yes? And so the problem is he's an attractive young man. She, over time, we kind of guess into this a couple years, has gone by, looks at him and says, man, he's got it going on. And she tries to seduce him doesn't work because Joseph says, I, I'm here for God's purpose. He says that right out. I'm following God. I, this, is, this is wrong against God. See, at level one, he's there. He trusted God that my labor is a sacred ambition that God gave to me, and you're not part of that. I tr believe you me. It's not, you're not there. And she makes a false accusation against him, and he ends up in the king's prison, which is interesting because he wasn't killed which makes you kind of wonder, I don't think Potiphar really believed her. But he had to do something. So he ends up in the king's prison. <clears throat> Not for the king, but the one that the king says, all the people I don't like, they go into this place. So he ends up in there. So what do you do when you're doing the right thing at home, and you, you've done everything you can to do the right thing with your family and your dad. You're pleasing your dad, your boss, you're, and at 17. And, and then you end up in this place where now you're in slavery. Like, I did my best, and this did not turn out so well at all. Right? And, and then you follow that through. And he did his best with Potiphar. And... It didn't turn out so well again. Would you get cynical and bitter over level one? Doesn't that happen sometimes when you do the right thing and you get burnt for it? And you say, why am I doing the right thing? I keep getting burnt. This is stupid. I'm not doing that. And so what we do is we abandon level one. Joseph did not abandon level one. He 
took level one and he added level two to it and said, when I'm faithful, there will be pain attached to it. That there will be naysayers, there will be people that hurt me, people that criticize me, people that don't like me. It will happen. Part of life. So he's doing that. He ends up in, in, in this prison place. And while he's in there, <clears throat> he's got to then reflect on, okay, I need to just keep giving my best. Even though I'm not getting paid for this, I'm in jail. My labor is a sacred ambition that God gave to me. I'm going to be faithful when it's painful. And so he continues to do that. And while he's doing that, he is blessed. God is with him, and the prison master, I guess, gives him promotions, and it's really a pretty cool thing. Or is it? See, <coughs> in order to do that, he had to be faithful to follow God, and in order to do that, he had to make sure that he was not getting bitter, angry, resentful. Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul talks about this. Where in Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul talks about, uh, in verses 19 through 21, he talks about the fruit of the flesh is... To be angry, bitter, resentful, filled with malice. So I hate my life. I hate these people. I hate what I'm doing. I'm angry with everybody, and, and you, you got me, you, you pushed me in the wrong direction. I'm just going to blow up at you. And Joseph had every, every right to be angry and bitter. But instead, he was filled with the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, right? And you see that attitude carrying itself out in a place that, that maybe was not so comfortable. Joseph was faithful when it was painful, even in prison. So let's go to level three. So how many of you are at level two? Some of you? Okay, don't raise your hand. That's kind of weird, right? I don't know if I want to say that. I, I mean, it feels so embarrassing to say I'm at level two. Like, I could ask you to stand up. That would be cool. All right, let's get to level three, okay? Level three. Because I want to push you to go from level one to level two to level three today. That you make this your journey, uh, that, you, that you follow God fully through this. Because here's level three. Level three is to embrace effective leadership. Embrace effective leadership. Leadership is not about position. It's about a mindset, that's worth writing down. Leadership is not about a position. It's about a mindset. How many of you are leaders? You can raise your hand if you agree with this. There's no embarrassing thing. How many of you are leaders? Raise your hand big and tall. How many of you are not leaders? How many of you are afraid to raise your hand right now? <laughs> because uh, about a third to uh, you know, half of you did not raise your hand at all. Every one of you are leaders. You say, well, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm not a leader. I don't have the gift of being a leader. No, 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 you do. Every one of you are leaders. Here's why I say that. Because you're called to lead yourself first. You're called to lead yourself first. Before you ever get into a position of leading anyone else, you must lead yourself first. Joseph had to lead himself first. In order to go from 17-year-old being the favorite at home to, to being in this position where he goes from being there to a slave to being in prison to the palace, he had to lead himself first all the way back here at 17 years old. We must lead ourselves first in all that we're doing. So in chapter 41, I said we'd get there, and now we are here. Here's chapter 41. While he was in prison, he had interpreted some dreams for a couple people, and they came true. And in chapter 41, you find two whole years had gone from the people that, were, that he interpreted dreams from. One of them uh, got out and died, and as he had said it would happen, and the other one got out <coughs> and was the cupbearer for the king, or for Pharaoh. It says, and after two full years... Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. Behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump. Now, I'm not sure how cows are attractive and plump. Just saying, wow, look at that cow. That's an attractive cow right there. Uh, but it just was. Anyway, I mean, do you read the Bible like this? It's, it's just, it's so great. And they fed, uh, they fed in the reed grass. 
and behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin. And they, they like, it didn't look like they had ever eaten anything. You know, their bones are coming, kind of coming out. You're like, how are they even alive? They come out of the Nile after them. And they stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. That's weird. Would you agree? That'd be a weird dream. Look at these thin, ugly, they're about to die cows. They, they, they just eat the big, fat, juicy cows. That's just odd. We don't show those kinds of things in, with the kids downstairs. We just kind of bump over this. Anyway, could you imagine the flannel graph? All right, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> and he fell asleep and dreamed a second dream. Behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good. I don't know what that looks like, but it is. They're on steroids or something. We're growing. <coughs> they were growing on a stalk, and behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by, by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump full ears, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his tr spirit was troubled. And he sent and called for the magicians of Egypt and, and all the wise men. So he said, listen, this is really a problem. I'm going to pull everybody together. I'll find the smartest people here, and I'm going to ask them to interpret my dream. You ever have a dream that you're like, what was that all about? Right? That's where he is. It says there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. Nobody. <coughs> but then the chief cupbearer comes up and he said, oh, you know what, Pharaoh, I totally forgot about this guy. A couple years ago, you remember when I got out of prison that you put me in? And uh, I want to be very careful how I say this, but there was this guy that interpreted my dream and the guy that was with me, the baker, you know, the guy that you hung, cut off his head. Yeah, so he interpreted both of our dreams three days prior and they both happened. I think you should probably get a hold of him and see what he says. So they do. They go down to Joseph. Where's Joseph? He's in prison, left for dead. They get him clothed, like they put nice clothing on him. They get him to shower and to shave. I mean, he looked like trash, felt like trash. I mean, that's what it says here. And, and so they pull him out, and so then he goes and, and gets in front of the Pharaoh, and now, can we just pause for a moment and think about this? Just, just feel where Joseph is at. Feel the moment. You're in prison, and in a few hours, you're standing before Pharaoh. What's your security level like internally? How do you feel? Are you nervous? Are you terrified you're going to say the wrong thing? Are you kind of like paralyzed a little bit? Because I think the average person, if you are in prison for all these years, by the way, it notes in verse 46 of chapter 41 that Joseph is 30 years old when he stands before Pharaoh. 30. So he was 17 when he got into this mess. Now he's 30, 13 years of just horrific pain. And he has this one moment where they say, here, let's shave you, let's clean you up, let's put some nice clothes on you. You have one moment to stand before Pharaoh. What do you do in that one moment that you stand before Pharaoh? Mentally and emotionally, won't you be a wreck? And Pharaoh says, Joseph, I had this dream. Let me tell you about it. He said, do you know the interpretation? And Joseph, he responds as if he's been standing as his best friend all this time. He stands totally secure in the person that's put, that, that, that he's, he's responsible for the prison that he's in. And the bad conditions that he had been in for years. And he talks to him as if they're buddies. So in verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. They quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, and he came before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had this dream, and nobody can interpret it. Go down to verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, and he gives him the dream and everything. So Joseph says to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed. 
Pause. Who revealed? God. God has revealed. Pharaoh, what's going on in your mind while you're sleeping, that dream that you're aware of, God has put that into you. God has made you aware of this. God is revealing something to you. And he says the seven good cows are seven good years, and the seven fruit, it's good years, then seven bad years. That's what's about to happen. The fact that you have two different dreams that say the same thing confirms that this is about to happen right now. By the way, can, this is a side note. This is like, I, I would do a rabbit trail on this one big time if I could this time. This was not Joseph's vision. This was not Joseph's dream. It was Pharaoh's. Why is that important? Because sometimes God gives a vision to somebody else for you to complete. And God brings you along to complete that. That's a side note. So go down to verse 29 then. <clears throat> it, says, it says, There will come seven years of, good, uh, of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them there will rise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land. It will be so bad that you'll forget about the good years. And the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that, that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, now, verse 33 is interesting because it's a turning point here in the conversation. First, he's interpreting the dream. Then second, you see his leadership. Joseph embraced effective leadership throughout his entire life. He embraced it with his dad back home. He embraced it when he was a slave. He embraced it when he was in prison. And now he's embracing it in the first conversation with Pharaoh. First conversation. He stands before Pharaoh, the most powerful man in all of the known world at the time. And he says this, verse 33. Now, therefore. Hey, by the way, Pharaoh, you listening? Hey, Pharaoh, come on now. about to happen next listen this is huge he's not insecure in fear what he's doing is he's he's demonstrating he's that he's embraced effective leadership in speaking to the pharaoh the number one guy he says this <clears throat> i totally lost my verse uh, verse 33 yeah there we go he says, now therefore let Pharaoh select a, a, a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh, he doesn't stop there. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint the overseers of the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years and let them gather all, of, uh, uh, all the food of these good years and, and the coming and the store of the grain under the authority of Pharaoh for good in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through this famine. That's it. In 30 seconds, he just totally gave him a full 15-year strategy plan. <laughs> Could you imagine you're standing before the guy that's probably very educated, powerful, and you're saying, hey, listen, let me give you the strategic planning that you should have for Egypt for the next 15 years as a result of what God just gave to you in that vision. <laughs> wow. Don't miss that. And so Pharaoh, in the next few verses, he says, wow, this is really great. Is there anybody like this that we could find the Spirit of God in, in all of Egypt? And he looked at Joseph, after all the different people, he looked at the, the wisest and smartest people all around him, and they're all just staring at Joseph, and here, this guy that was a prisoner just a few hours ago. And they're all looking at him, and he just takes the, the, the whole stage presence and everybody just looks, and Pharaoh says, you're, okay, you're the guy. You've got to do this. You carry out that strategic plan that you just said for the next 15 years. No one's above you. You're above everybody else. Is that cool? Would that be fun? 
If you're Joseph, would you be like, yeah! Or would you be terrified? Or a bit of both? <laughs> I mean, think about what you're doing. I'm about to take over this kingdom, and I was just in jail. Okay, this is an interesting day, right? Some people run from responsibility. Some people run from effective leadership. Let me really quickly, I'm going to give you what an effective leader is, and I, I could spend an hour on this, and I've, this is something I've actually been teaching and working with people on for the past few months, and I just want to kind of give you something as just a little nugget. It's for yourself and for any leadership position that you're in. To be an effective leader, there's three parts of that, okay? <clears throat> three parts. Be an effective leader, you need to be active, proactive, and reactive, okay? To be, to, to be an effective leader, you have to have all three of these parts. Joseph demonstrates this effectively. He understands what it is to be active. He's present with people consistently. He's curious about them. He's a great listener. He's able to have a relationship with them. That's being active, to be an effective leader, you have to be active with people. You can't just be oblivious to where people are at and what they're going through. You've got to know what's going on, personally and professionally. Reactive. To be an effective leader, you have to react to things that are going on. You've got to know what's going on, and when emergencies come up, you can't just say, well, hopefully it'll go away and put your head in the sand. You have to react appropriately to that. And then to be an effective leader, you have to be proactive. You've got to be thinking ahead and having a plan for what's next. You have to be thinking ahead, not just tomorrow, but next week, next month, next year. And typically in today's uh, economy, with business anyway, there's a three to five year strategic plan that you have to have in place at all times to know where am I going. That's where great businesses and leaders really go. But it's interesting to note that about 80%, and the, the numbers vary based on different uh, research uh, places like Forbes and Harvard Business and stuff like that, 80% do not have a strategic plan in place for their business of small to medium-sized businesses, which is interesting. That's business structure. Do you know in family, we live paycheck to paycheck, and most businesses are paycheck to paycheck because there's no strategic plan for the future. You're not thinking about your retirement. You're not thinking about how you're going to take uh, your community and stuff like that. And in our church, we developed a strategic plan this year. Why? Back in February, because we want to think three to five years out and say, okay, where are we going to be? Now, in order to do that, you actually have to look at all three of those things and say, okay, that's the strategic plan. And what you have to do, like Joseph, you have to look through and say, okay, in 15 years as he had, you have to have mile markers all along the way and say, I'm going to go from here to here to here to here to here to here so that our country doesn't die in 15 years. Okay? There's a lot of applications to this. Very simply, you have to lead yourself first. Where do you want to be next year? What person do you want to become next year? I don't care if you're retired or if you're 17. What person do you want to be next year? Build a strategic plan for yourself first. And don't just have this, see, strategic and plan, they actually don't go together. Plan is, I would like to have a million dollars in my savings account. Strategic is, I'm going to put things in place to get to this place. Do you see that? It's very different. <clears throat> Joseph was an effective leader because he did this. He knew how to be active, proactive, and reactive. What I find most people are doing in their life, and this is personal, it doesn't matter if you're a stay-at-home mom, it doesn't matter if you're a CEO of a company, it doesn't matter where you are at in life. Most people are living reactively. And because of that, what they do in living in a reactive world is they bring other people into that, and they always live in a crisis mode. They're living paycheck to paycheck. To lead yourself first, to be an effective leader in that you're embracing this, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm not going to live in this reactive world. I'm going to acknowledge that's part of me, but it becomes a smaller percentage as I'm more proactive. If you wonder how to get out of the financial mess you're in, be proactive. Think ahead. No, I'm not going to buy that because that's going to put me in a mess in three months. No, I'm not going to go out to eat because... Put a budget in place, not because you want to restrict and control yourself in, this, in a negative sense of, of, of just hurting yourself, but because you have a strategic plan for the future. Think about who you're with, who you're around. Are they helping you to become the person that you need to be? And then there's people you have to be around. What are you doing in relation to the people you have to be around? Be proactive. 
not just reactive. And often when a person is reactive, they're not actually active with people. The only time they're with people are when they're dealing with a crisis. Now, I would spend a lot more time on that because you see that all throughout Scripture. Jesus Christ is a perfect picture of an effective leader on all three. He understood how to be proactive, reactive, and active, and he did it with his disciples on, an, on a regular basis. It's fascinating. So I say this, level up and embrace effective leadership, as Joseph did. The whole vision from God would need the wisdom from a proactive leader who would go in and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to work ahead. I'm going to build the steps and have a plan that's in place. I'm going to go visit with people and do different things, and I'm going to predict the resources that's needed to be able to make this plan happen. He was active in that he would go and he'd build consistent relationships with people. And that's what you find him doing in Genesis 41. He immediately goes out and he's with people. And he's going out throughout all of Egypt. He doesn't sit in an office all by himself. He's going out with people. And he's saying, okay, let's work on this. He's active and he's reactive. And you'll find in the next few chapters, chapter 46 specifically, when he's dealing with his brothers in 45 and all, he's dealing with his brothers. He's reacting to them and reacting to the circumstances all around in a way that's effective and right. Why? Because he's worked at all three of these effectively. So effective leaders are simply just working at all three. So here's my question. What level are you at? What level are you at? Are you level one? In that you're just simply trusting God. My labor is a secret ambition that God gave to me. And I'm just, I'm struggling through every day just to say that. And I wake up and I say, I know, Pastor, you said last week, uh, you know, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm having a hard time rejoicing and be glad in it. But I'm working at that. That's awesome. Keep working at it. But recognize the next level. Know what's coming. Be faithful even when it's painful. And that actually, when you begin to build into that, it's going to feed level one. And your faith will grow in level one because you're embracing level two. Pain's part of the process. You will never be successful unless you walk through pain. And then level three is you have to lead yourself first and then lead others. And it doesn't matter what position you're in. There's always leadership to have happen around you. Embrace effective leadership. So here's my question. What level are you at? So this would be a time where you could say, okay, I'm going to take a note here. Maybe put in your phone or write down, I'm at level one or I'm at level two. Well, this last week I was at level three, but I can see that I keep going back to level two. What do you need to do to be at level three? Because when you're at level three, you're Galatians 5, to 23, you're walking in the Spirit, and God's Spirit is working in you, and you're there with other people, and you love on them, and you're joyful, and you're peaceful, and, and you're tender, and you're, you're doing what you're supposed to do by God's Spirit working in and through you, and you're a blessing. Let me, let me just kind of note this as I close. Joseph's legacy was all about his work, wasn't it? And Joseph's legacy simply came because he responded this way. He trusted God. His labor is a sacred ambition that God gave to him. He was faithful, even when it was painful. And then he embra embraced effective leadership. You see that through his life, and his legacy was made as a result of that. Was it an easy life? Nope. Read the rest of Genesis chapter 41 because it's interesting to see how he relates all of that. He is vulnerable with us. So I'm not sure what you're going through. Maybe right now, you're going through a really lousy time. Or maybe you're going through the best time ever. I'm not sure. Would you go to the next level? Like, just start with that. Take one moment and say, okay, Lord, I need to stop. I trust you. You know what you're doing, God. Help me be faithful when it's painful. And show me how to lead myself first. Could be that God is working in you right now. 
to do something incredible. You won't see in your life until 22 years later. You don't know. But God knows what he's doing. So trust him. Yeah, let's pray. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, God, that you put us exactly where you want us to be. It's hard sometimes. Because where we want to be is out in a resort and just relaxing and having people take care of us and everything is kind of peachy and good. Most times it's kind of what we're looking for. But Lord, you put us into a different position where you gave us a sacred ambition. And because of sin, it's going to be painful. So Lord, help us to be right with you. And to follow you. Teach us your ways. Lord, for those that are really going through it right now, that they're facing all kinds of pain, Lord, would you give them grace to follow you? Give them grace to not get bitter and angry. Give them the grace to be able to love as your spirit would have them to love. To have the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, thank you for how you used Joseph back then and how you're still using him with us today. We give you praise for how you're using us in our lives with the people around us. And Lord, as we go, I pray that you just give us strength for all that you have planned. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Hey, thank you. It's a privilege to be together. As you go out, your work is what? A sacred ambition that God gave to you. Hey, level up. Have a great day.